This is the Ag Engineering Podcast that rolls right into the details on tools, tips, and techniques that improve you, your farm, and our world. I'm your host, Andy Chamberlain from the University of Vermont Extension, and this podcast is sponsored by Northeast SARE. Thanks for listening. Today's episode comes to you from Southampton, New Hampshire, where I took a visit to one of the larger vegetable farms within the Northeast with Andre Contelmo of Heron Pond Farm. My name is Andre Contelmo. We're here at Heron Pond Farm in Southampton, New Hampshire, where we grow 60 acres of mixed vegetables um, and gross uh, between a million, million five a year. Uh, we have uh, diversity in sales with wholesale, direct to consumer, uh, roadside stand, um, farmer's market, and CSA. We started out on his farm checking out the tomato room, which is a cooler specifically designed for storing the harvested tomatoes. In that room, he shares a little bit about the harvest crates, and then we walk into his primary cooler that is under construction. And mind you, I visited here in the end of July, and he had no cooler. So if you catch that, it's a 60-acre farm with no cooler in July. Um, so pay attention here because he had moisture issues, condensation problems, rotted out the floor due to lack of insulation, and now he's redoing that. But he's adding concrete, and the trick here is he's adding concrete to the second floor of this building where the cooler is. So really cool construction, and he shares kind of what is involved with that and how, how, it's, how he hopes for it to turn out. So enjoy this episode on coolers. These crates, these are from Harvest Lug. And I'm gonna get a bunch of different sizes, but this is the Harvest Lug crate. Um, we like it um, for heirloom single level and for reds, uh, sometimes we'll do double levels and stuff. They hold like 20 pounds, they don't dent the fruit and um, they obviously offset locks so that you can stack them. But the thing is, the transportation is amazing with them in that they don't fall. Because we have, you know, the hay grove is all the way up the hill. It's a mile, it's a uh, acre and a quarter greenhouse. And then we do an, uh, another almost two acres of field production. So having these is great. And then we discovered another use for those is um, we've mechanized our greens production. And so we put, we put our mic, our, um, our salad greens in here and they run through the AZS just this way. And then we put the tsunami and everything in. We had to put a valve, I'll show you that later. We had to put a valve into the uh, AZS to slow down the rinse water because it was damaging the greens. And then, um, but as soon as we did that, the new model of the AZS actually has a dial that you can actually regulate. Um, but we just put a um, two inch ball valve in and it just slows that water to feed down. And then, um, you already have your tsunami that you can monitor in there and everything and it goes through and then we just take those and dump them into the bins that go into the spinner and then the other thing that we now use these harvest lugs for is new potato harvest Har new potato skin so easy and we were like we're handling too many times unfortunately in the video my daughter is on the end of the AZS and she dumps him into a bucket I'm like oh my god but we only put one layer of new potatoes in the bottom out in the field, and then we, um, and then we take these all back to the wash station, and then they can just be sat on that AZS and run through, and then from the time that they were taken off the plant to the time that they're in the bulb crates, they've only been touched the one time that they were picked up, and so all those loose skins and stuff, and new and potatoes are a huge, huge crop for us. Um, you know, we, we do a lot with new potatoes. So that, that would be such a, like a high value item. <laughs> an know, acre, an acre of an acre of new potatoes accurately harvest like harvest it on time and in the right window because we can start harvesting our new potatoes the second week of June because we green sprout and no one else has them and at that rate they're worth sixty five thousand dollars an acre. <laughs> so like why? I mean that's tomato money. Yeah. Right. And a heck of a lot easier. You're not trellising them. You're not doing any of that. So that's the tomato room. All right, here's a blunder. This was the first big walk-in I built. 
And this is, um, this is the hemlock decking that was on top of it. And so if you look at this, we have the rough cut hemlock, three quarter, four boards, and then on the hemlock decking, because we were gonna put so much of a load on it, we engineered these. They're into engineered hangers on this side, and over here, thinking it through, uh, you can't see it that way. If you come <laughs> over here, you can see it, fine. See, that's, that's a steel rail that runs the whole length and ties right into the, uh, con those are concrete beams that are encased in hemlock so that when we're down there in the root cellar, if we hit them, we don't break the concrete beam. But anyway, that metal is tied in there. So this was all sitting there. We thought we were all wicked smart because we have these one foot apart and so that the, when we stack in the bins of carrots and stuff three high, yep. that, oh, it's, the floor is going to take the load. We should have taken heed to the whole glass of ice water on a hot summer's day thing <laughs> because what you see here, and this whole floor was rotten. And then, and then there, it's not so bad, but this rot, and then all of this rot, and this rot, that's all because if we, I, it, we could have used a wood floor in our cooler for probably a decade, maybe two decades, if I had insulated with spray foam from the bottom and I didn't. And then everything from- So there was nothing, no insulation. No, and then everything from the floor condensed and rotted the floor from actually the bottom out, not the top. So from up here, we never saw any moisture and how quickly did that happen? Uh, this was built in 2013, so it's less than 10 years. Yeah. And, and so... Um, to, to the point of failure. <laughs> to, the point, to the point of failure. So now, we're going with a poured floor in here. But in order to do that, I didn't have the minimum depth. Hmm. So um, I have to cut all of the rafters back three inches... So we have the three inches and the two inches and the three quarter inches. And that's because um, this has all got to be blocked. Steel reinforced on both sides. And then I can take you outside and show you the decking that goes down. So I guess it's a good thing then you've got uh, your floor joists on 12 two, inch centers. <laughs> yes, because it's going to be holding concrete. So then this metal flooring goes down on top of it. And because it's got an inch and a half throw, your shallowest point is, you know, just four inches, just over three inches. And then the deeper points will be five inches, five, five and a half to four inches. That's what it goes. So our shallowest thickness of the floor will be four and five. And so in order to do that, we have to do this, lay these down. But then through the metal reinforcement on the side, um, across the floor this way, we have to attach half inch rebar mm -hmm. this way and then tie in rebar going that way from uh, the length of it. And the reason for that is <clears throat> now the metal floor and the, um, if we tie it in that way, the metal floor and the concrete becomes structural. So now um, you're not even actually depending on the joists. Oh, interesting. Because now so you, you're full span. You're, you're, you full spanned it. So that's using a, this metal, using the metal and the rebar, the rebar that's tied in, tied into the, me, so the, the metal, the metal that. lips at the yep. edges of the, of the, of the floor. So yeah, we have a, you know, concrete guy coming and doing it and yeah, I mean, that's, they're going to be a hugely expensive thing. And yep. then the thing about what concrete is that you have to, um, now you have to insulate because the concrete will suck the cold right out of the <laughs> place. So. Really, um, the irony is now we're gonna blow the insulation into the whole bottom. We normally clean out the root cellar and just use it for our, we use it for our roots, um, mainly our potatoes and stuff like that. But now I'm gonna um, put food grade paneling on the ceiling mm -hmm. and paint the sides and actually dig out the, the, the dirt floor down there and pour a floor down there and thus like make that a, an extended pack room. And yeah, stuff. yeah, yeah. That's interesting. I've been, 
you know, long-term planning a barn for myself. And I'm like, man, it would be great to have a barn with a basement, but I really want to use the main floor of the barn like a garage, so a concrete floor, so I'm not like dripping. Well, I'll tell you how I would have done it. Like, <laughs> There's hybrid, um, hybrid steel trussing. Mm. Would have been cheaper than all of this. Um, and you can, you can definitely steel have trussing. that engineered. And it's like, basically, it's just two pieces of steel channel. You've seen it with the yeah. wiggle wire in between. <laughs> yeah. And it's only like, you know, the, the, the steel wire looks, it's like only like that. Hmm. And you're like, how is that? But it's all to grade. And the other thing is when you do that, you can use the featherweight. Um, they put it like a, it's like a material plastic reinforced. Um, and you can go like, I could have went with like a three inch pour. Oh, so they have a different mix. It's a different concrete. mix, and you don't need the corrugation. Yeah. And you, so you can go with a flat floor okay. as, your, as your form. And then, um, and then you can go with a three-inch pour. I, but now, because I can't, because I'm reversing it, <laughs> I have to go with a four to five-and-a-half-inch pour yeah, that's pretty through thick. the corrugation. That's a lot more material over mm -hmm. 30 feet, mm -hmm. you know. So that's... That, the, these are mistakes that I wish I did not make. Yeah, well, and ha how many acres are you growing on? 60. 60, and you don't have a walk-in? No, we have we have a 48-foot trailer with, uh, you know, this is a reefer trailer. Yeah. With I, stairs. With stairs, because they're in and out of it every day. If That, that was our normal Ooh. summer walk-in cooler, right? That and the farm stands cooler. And then um, this was only used to, um, this was actually um, our carriage just about fit in there. We have a few <laughs> extra bins. But like in the winter when we do our big carrot harvest, uh, so the carrots come in here November 1st and they leave by, well, really like in April, we can move them back into the big walk-in and close this. And then this is only running, you can hardly ever, see, I mean like you could fill up that tank in the winter and it'd be a week, two right, weeks. Right. Now we're like, look at it every other day, <laughs> you know? It's what happens when you make a big mistake like that and you are taking your summer when you're supposed to be farming to fix it. So did you buy this trailer? Are you renting it? Nope, bought it. And so what's one of those set you at? All over the place now. <laughs> um, you can get one of these in pretty halfway decent shape for about seven. Um, if you're like seven grand, yeah, for a full tractor trailer reefer truck. Yeah, they're more often around twelve to seventeen. But that seems. But then you can. That seems cheap to me. It, it, yeah, well. Like for a drop it off and you have a cooler. Yeah. You know, you can move it if you wanted to. That's not a bad option. Yeah, I have another one coming in the fall because <laughs> I might carrots up with the beets in the other one. Yeah. Just to give more room to the... Yeah, no, it's a definitely a, a, a no-brainer. I mean, if you are on it and you get there in an auction when, like, Stop and Shop or something is, like, selling them off, mm. you can get them for, like, 4500 bucks. But you've got to be there. you got to have um, you got to have ability to haul it within 24 hours. Yeah, yeah. And you got to be there with your paddle number. And you have to know where the auction... I mean, like, all that is like an inside game. You know, like... It, and, and you're a farmer. Right, right. So do you belong doing... Do you belong doing that, you know? Or do you belong, like, you know, paying a broker? Auctioning has got to be your game. So, yeah, <laughs> I don't want to go... I don't want to go to an auction. I, I just want to do that. But most of your stuff on the farm is handled in crate scale, or are you moving pallets around? We move pallets, um, but not now, because that is not conducive to pallets. Because in order to make it workable for the crew, it's stacked on both sides and with a walkway in the middle. Okay. It used to be two-zone cooler, which was awesome. But we had to rip out the center panel just to make it doable for us. So unfortunately, we lost the ability to do two zones in that, which somebody would have paid good money for. But, you know, I don't know what to say. But it's, it's, it's remarkably quiet. Nah, it's not that loud. Um, and, you know, if you had two of them, it would be, it would be fine. Chris Callahan, this is the outside of that cooler that, um, that, we, that we were in, you and I. Mm -hmm. 
And what you'll notice, which is kind of uncommon to think about, is that there's two completely separate independent cooling systems, two compressors, two evaporator sets. Is Not that for redundancy? No. Um, it's because um, the way that the system is designed for the, how we run it um, in the summer and the winter, we run a half, we only run with one of them in the winter and two of them in, in the summer, or we can shut one, or we can shut them and both down. And that's more efficient than and having one big one. And it's more efficient than having one big one. And then the other thing is that these units are actually, because we run them in the winter, they're all freezer units instead of just walking coolers. So the defrost on them is mega. Yeah. <laughs> and so it happens, the defrost cycle is like half the cycle that other people saw. Those were like huge tips from um, the Ramon extension. You know, you guys, I mean, it was, it was a big deal. Efficiency like, gains for oh, sure. Oh, big time. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, you don't get a sense of how big the cooler is when you're stuck in that little that box working on it. But like, I mean, it's it's a third of this building. Like when you're looking yeah. at it from out here, it actually looks like something. It's right? a good sized barn. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I mean, it's got more square footage than that. Yep. Believe it or not, because it's wider and and you can stack three high instead of two high in there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's 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 a great cooler. I, I just wish I had insulated the floor right from the get-go. <laughs> I mean, eventually that floor would have rotted. Yeah. But not in 10 years or eight years or whatever it is now. Yeah. And then, yeah, and the, the, the headache of working. You can see some of them right here. Yeah, it's these are some. These are some of the boards. <laughs> this is the boards. These was the decking. Taking this out of the decking. Look at this. Look at that. I mean, some of them, of course, like look look like the day they went in. But a bunch of them look like that. And that ain't cool. That's, you know. It's interesting that it's kind of random. It wasn't random. As you go no. in there, um, the, uh, the condensation point is exactly in the, because it's, they're running doubles. Oh. Measure it. It's worse in the exact center and progressively gets better mm. as you, the rot gets better as you go away, except for the door, right in the doorway. And that's because the doorway has the differential as well, as you would think. So basically, it's like, it's math. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And, and, and yeah, I, I didn't even see the pattern until I was like cutting, I'm cutting, the, I'm trimming them back. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh my God, they're worse. Thanks for listening to today's episode. I hope you enjoyed it. If I can ask you or direct you to do one thing, that is to go to the website for this podcast, agengpodcast.com. That's A-G-E-N-G-P-O-D-C-A-S-T.com. There you'll find the show notes. You'll find links to the farmer who we chatted with today, as well as photos or videos uh, from the call when I visited the farm. If you've got some feedback to share, my contact information's on there, or you can leave me a voicemail, and you can do that right from the link in the description in the mobile app you're listening to this to, so go ahead and do that. Thanks again for listening, and I hope you have a great day.